Hello everyone, this is Professor Hasselman, History 104, and in this week's lectures we're going to start talking about Ancient Greece, or excuse me, Ancient Rome. We talked about Ancient Greece last week, this week we're going to be talking about Ancient Rome. And in these lectures we're going to be talking about uh, the rise of Rome, uh, the Roman Republic, including its government and politics, uh, Roman imperialism, and the culture of the Roman uh, Republic. So that's, let me just double check, yeah, those are the four different topics that we're going to be talking about today. So let's begin with ancient Rome. Give me one second here. So we've already talked about the Middle Eastern civilizations. We've talked about the development of ancient Greece, its development of literature, its development of uh, culture and civilization. And now we're going to talk about uh, Rome. And we're going to talk about the development of Rome over time here. So we've, we've already discussed the fall of uh, ancient Greece, the development of the Hellenistic world, and here we go. Now the area where the Romans emerged, uh, the plain of Latium, which gives its name to Latin, um, it's Lazio today, um, is in the center of the Italian peninsula, but it's not a, a very big area. Now the Romans have been central to the Western tradition. They created stable, efficient political institutions that have been admired and emulated for centuries. They created the most influential secular legal system in the history of the world. And they were masters of what we might call civil engineering. Need water 50 miles away? No problem. Rome will build an aqueduct. Need to conquer an enemy ensconced on a 1,300 foot high plateau? No problem. Rome will build a ramp. Now, in many ways, the Romans were unlikely players on the world stage. They emerged in the plain of Latium, which gave its name to Latin, as I mentioned already, in the center of the Italian peninsula. Italy as a whole is some 750 miles long from the Alps to the sea, but Roman Italy ran from the Rubicon River to the sea. The whole Italian area divides into several distinct regions. The Po River Valley lies in the north, called by the Romans Cisalpine Gaul, or Gaul on this side of the Alps. The area has rich agricultural land and a mild continental climate. Liguria, Tuscany was the region north of Latium and Rome. People called the Etruscans, people called the Etruscans lived here when the Romans came on the scene. Campania, literally the countryside, was the area south of Latium. The Samnites lived here amidst high, more than 2,000 meters, rough mountain ridges. Uh, Magna Gracia uh, was the area in the south, the heel and toe, as well as Sicily, where Greeks were a major presence from the 8th century. Now, the Iron Age came to central Italy around 1000 BC. The first settlers around later Rome date from around 800. Uh, Roman tradition says that their city was founded in the year we call 753 BCE. Rome was a pretty well sighted, 15 miles inland on a navigable river at a good fort. Seven hills provided residential areas around the swampy lowlands and defense in case of attack. But Italy's best harbors faced west and all the action in the Mediterranean was in the east, north of Rome. The Etruscans and south of Rome, the Greeks, were major threats. Latium itself was a region of small villages not yet under Roman sway. Now tradition says that the Romans expelled the last Etruscan king, Tarquin, the Proud, in 509 BCE and created a republic. Now that tradition bears a little scrutiny. During these two centuries, Rome progressed from a few scattered settlements to a city. Romans created their first forum, built with first stone buildings, laid out streets, and erected the first walls. Probably the influence of the Greeks to the south was decisive. Now, this renders controversial the relationship between the Romans and the Etruscans to their north. The Etruscans are uh, a somewhat mysterious people who lived in 12 small cities and who became rich from farming, mining, and trade. Now, Roman legend says that the Etruscans conquered the Romans, who then liberated themselves, but probably there was a long period of rivalry and mutual influence. Now, tradition also says that Rome was ruled by seven kings. Kings, yes. Seven, maybe. 
Kings had broad powers in war, religion, and daily life, and left a deep imprint on Rome's later institutions. Kings were assisted by fathers, or patres, hence the term patrician, or well-fathered ones, like the Greek uh, eupatrids, who formed a council called a senate, from the Latin senex, which means old man, uh, and you can kind of compare this to what we talked about with Sparta earlier. Now, ordinary people, so those were the patricians, ordinary people were plebeians. There was an assembly of all citizens that could take legislative initiative, although its measures had to be approved by the Senate. Early Rome was very much open to foreigners, unlike most Greek cities. Now, almost all the evidence for the creation of the Roman Republic is late and tends to collapse into a short time development that took decades and maybe even centuries. Two basic century, or changes were crucial. Liberty, the freedom of the people to participate rather than be ruled by a king, and republic, from the Latin res publica, or the public thing. Uh, government, the state itself, was an affair that belonged to everyone. It was not res privita, or the private or personal thing of a single ruler. Because Romans did not embrace the idea of equality, the idea of who the people were, uh, were, allowed, people were who were allowed to participate was worked out in early years of the Republic. Now, two basic mechanisms drove political and institutional changes in the early Republic. Poor plebeians wanted land, debt relief, and published laws, while rich plebeians pleb plebeians, excuse me, wanted access to public offices that were restricted to patricians. Now, Rome's patricians carried out a policy of expanding defense. Towns and regions around Rome were seen as potential enemies. Therefore, the Romans attacked and either neutralized or conquered them. Now, this more or less continuous warfare demanded participation of the plebes. Now, several times, the plebes seceded from the Roman state to wrangle conscious or concessions, excuse me, from the patricians. Plebes organized themselves into a plebeian council that could pass laws binding on all the plebes. Now, this created a solidarity. Eventually, the plebes got ten tribunes as defenders of their interests, and they could veto acts of magistrates or laws of patrician assemblies. In 449, Twelve tables bearing laws were erected in the Forum, and by 367 BCE, the plebeians could be elected consul, the highest office in the Roman state. In 287, the Licinian Sextian Law granted the legislation of the plebeians assembly full binding power on all the Roman people. Now, by the early decades of the 3rd century BCE, Rome was, formally at least, a democracy and dominant in central Italy. It remains for us to see how that Roman political system worked. The middle years of the third century also saw the initiation of the military activities that gained, gained Rome an empire. Yet, already we can see that Rome had been a relatively stable and efficient system, with mechanisms for reforming itself for, far, for much longer than any of the Greek polis had even managed. Now, the Roman government, like others, was partly institutions. It was partly ideologies, fundamental governing underlying ideas, and it was fundamentally the social practices that evolved that changed over time. So now let's take a look at the Roman Republic, and specifically its government and politics. Now, the Roman Republican Constitution was a combination of institutions, ideologies, social values, and historical experience. Now, we're fortunate to know a great deal about it. The Roman magistrates operated on a basis of collegiality and annuality. The officers cooperated formally and informally, and they changed every year. Now, the highest magistrate was the consul. Two, elected annually, convened the voting assemblies and led the army. Ex-consuls entered the Senate automatically. Praetors were the judicial officers. Originally, there were two, but finally as many as eight. They, prescribed, they presided in courts 
and issued Praetor's Edicts on taking office. These added to the body of Roman law. Now, ex-praetors also entered the Senate automatically. So we have the consul, the highest, two of them, and then praetors, eight. And once they were removed from their, their position after one year, after they stepped down after one year, they automatically entered the Senate. Quaestors, Q-U-A-E-S-T-O-R-S, were the financial officers of the state. They received taxes, fines, and tributes, and let out state contract for such things as waterworks. They were elected annually, but could also be appointed by consuls. Now, originally there were two, but this rose to, rose to an undetermined number. Ex quaestors entered the Senate automatically again. Idles, or spelt A E D I L E S, had the responsibility for the food supply, public buildings and streets, games and entertainment. Now, ten tribunes were elected from the plebs and continued to have responsibility for the best interests of the ordinary people and the power to veto acts of the magistrates and assemblies. Two censors were elected every five years and served for 18 months. Their primary task was to set the census status of every citizen and to legislate on public morality. So basically to tell which position they belong in, uh, either the plebeians or the p patricians. Now, Rome's assemblies present a slightly confusing image. The curiate assembly from the royal period withered under the Republic, and the plebeian council declined after 287 BCE. The Senate was originally restricted to patricians, then open to former holders of high offices. It passed treaties but could not legislate. The tribal assembly constituted the Roman people organized according to districts, of which there were 33, four in the city and 29 in the surrounding countryside. Always a boon to wealthy landowners. Now, the centuriate assembly constituted the Roman people organized according to wealth into 192 centuries. The wealthiest Romans made up the majority of the centuries. Legislation could be introduced by magistrates or ordinary Romans. Bills were read three times in the Roman Forum, vigorously debated, and then voted on. Assemblies used the system of block voting. There were 33 votes in the tribal assembly and 192 in the centurion. Think of the U.S. Electoral College today. So basically, one elector represents a whole number of, of citizens. Now the big question is, how did this system work? Now the first critical point to remember is that deference was paid to age, experience, and tradition. The oldest member of the Senate, the Prince of the Senate, spoke first. The Senate did not pass laws, but issued influential opinions. Uh, and we call this Senatus Consulta these influential opinions. The Senate was made up of former holders of high offices, tribes and centuries caucus before voting, and the signores spoke and voted before the ignores. So the elderly spoke before the juniors. Now, patron-client bonds were critical to the operation of Roman society as a whole. The rich and powerful had large numbers of people in various bonds of obligation. A remarkably small number of families, fewer than 100, provided almost all the officers of the Roman Republic for the first 400 years of its existence. Now historians speak of a senatorial aristocracy. This is perhaps understandable before the uh, attainment of essential equality between patricians and plebeians, but harder to understand thereafter. So in other words, it made sense that before the plebeians, the, the lower parts of society earned the power after over the patricians, and or at least an equality with the patricians, it's not quite sure why after um, this happened, we still have a senatorial aristocracy in Rome. And the other thing to remember that I mentioned in the lecture is that Rome was not a, a legal law-making system. It was a system of elderly and some juniors that 
provided consul to the government. Now, the Central Roman Republic, or excuse me, political and social values contributed to the preservation of the system. Octoritas, uh, Romans placed great stress on the eminence, the inner dignity of their greatest citizens, past and present. This was not, in principle, a matter of wealth or birth. Another term that was used by the Romans was mos morium, or the custom of our ancestors. And this was to Romans the guiding light in all things. And this is how most speeches began. So in other words, Rome placed great stress on prestige and inner dignity and the greatest citizens. Those were the models of society and they looked at their, the custom of their ancestors. So a very uh, conservative way of looking at uh, events. Now perhaps the greatest critique of and assessment of this system came from the Greek historian Polybius, who lived from around 200 to 118 BCE. Polybius was a learned Greek captured by the Romans in Greece and brought back to live for decades in honorable captivity among the most influential Romans. Now he wrote a history of his times, the sixth book of which is a penetrating evaluation of Rome's system. He wanted to understand how a people so recently barbarian, 400 years in the past, had come to conquer the known world in such a short time. He attributed their success to their mixed constitution. Consuls were like kings or a monarchy. Citizens were like aristocrats, an oligarchy. And assemblies were like the demos, democracy. Plebeius had a characteristic Greek view of the cyclical evolution of politics. Monarchy, followed by oligarchy, followed by democracy, leading to mob rule, which leads back to monarchy. And he believed that Romans had escaped the cycle. Now, was Polybius right? Well, yes and no. The Roman system was remarkably stable for a long time, and the mixed dimension of the constitution was there for all to see. Now, Polybius said nothing about the culture of deference or the senatorial aristocracy, and Polybius' views could not address the strains on a small, tradition-bound city-state of the acquisition of world empire. Now, the Roman system has been in concrete institutional structures and in fundamental ideological notions formative in later Western political development. All right. So let's take this one step further, and we've de described the, the development of the Roman political system. Um, now, when finally the Roman Republic collapsed into a military dictatorship, Rome had emperors. Then the word Roman Empire refers to a particular kind of political regime, and that regime still had an empire as a geographical entity. So let's talk about, the Roman, about Roman imperialism. Now, in this section, we're going to explore the emergence and early history of the Roman Empire and discuss some of the ways in which that empire affected Rome. But first, let's clear up the language that we'll use. Now, hearing the term Roman Empire may conjure up an image of the far-flung territories over which Rome ruled, or it may suggest the imperial regime or the government of the Caesars. Now, in fact, both terms are appropriate but in different ways at different times. Under the Republic, and this is the subject of uh, what we'll be talking about in this little section, Rome acquired provinces all over the Mediterranean world, acquired, that is, an empire. Now, amidst civil wars, Rome's Republic collapsed into a military dictatorship. The Roman Empire was born in the sense of a Roman regime in which power was in the hands of emperors. But, the empire, in a physical, geographical sense, kept right on expanding. Now, before Rome got entangled with other peoples in the Mediterranean world, in the Hellenistic world, the Romans waged war for two and a half centuries in Italy. Last and previously, we alluded to some of the political and institutional consequences of that warfare. Rome gradually forged the Latin League in Latium. The Latins revolted in the period between 340 and 338 BCE, but the Romans successfully put down the revolt. In 354 BCE, Rome made a treaty with the Samnites. 
Now, a border provoc in the Samnites of the south, which I had mentioned earlier. The provocation, the border provocation, led to a series of three Samnite wars, which uh, ran from about 343 to 290 BCE, which brought Rome to a frontier with Magna Graecia. Now, some Greeks had aided the Samnites, which Rome considered a provocation. And to protect themselves, the Greek called in King Pyrrhus of Epirus, who was defeated by Rome. Uh, Pyrrhus lost because of uh, Pyrrhic victories Now, during the period of 280 to 276 BCE. Rome then dominated Magna Graecia and all of Italy. Now, certain fundamental and long-standing aspects of Roman military tactics and diplomatic practice emerged already in this Italian phase of Roman expansion. Early Romans seem to have borrowed the hoplite phalanx from the Greeks, and this demonstrates a constant theme of Roman history, a pragmatic willingness to borrow that works. So in other words, whereas Greek, the Greeks kind of um, uh, centered or kind of pushed themselves away from everybody else and became very insular. Uh, the Romans assimilated and expanded. But in mountainous Samnite country, the phalanx was not useful. You know, ask a World War II veteran who fought through that country what it was like. Now, gradually, the Romans changed their tactics. And by the end of the Samnite Wars, Romans had developed a, a de and deployed the legion, or bodies of troops arranged in checkerboard patterns with great mobility and flexibility. Now, Roman diplomacy was the stuff of legend in antiquity and has been admired and emulated ever since. Roman diplomacy's first key principle was that of the just war. The gods would not give Rome a victory in a war of aggression. Therefore, the Romans always had to assure themselves that they were avenging an attack or, as the theory evolved, forestalling an attack, so a preemptive attack. The second key principle was generosity towards the conquered. Beginning with the Latins in 338 BCE, Rome's conquered enemies, at least in Italy, were offered very favorable peace terms and accorded a second-class Roman citizenship. So that's the first two. The third key principle was divide and conquer. The Romans rarely made the exact same deal with any two people. Thus, potential foes did not have the same grievances. Now, a corollary of this, or a, uh, an adaptation of this, in addition, was the Roman principle that, quote, your friend is your neighbor, but one. A fourth element was Rome's sheer tenacity. Once embarked on a policy, Rome simply did not abandon it. Rome's enemies came to know this. So again, those four principles was the idea of a just war, the idea uh, that uh, generosity towards the conquered was an important aspect, divide and conquer, and uh, sheer tenacity. That's why the Roman Empire was able to expand. Now, in conquering the Greeks of southern Italy, Rome came face to face with the Carthaginians, who had important trading bases in Sicily, the island just south of Italy, and who may have lent some aid to Rome's enemies in the Pyrrhic Wars. Now, again, uh, because of the uh, the idea that war was to avenge your in the avenge the enemy, or of revenge, it made sense that between 264 BCE and 146 BCE, Rome fought three Punic Wars with the Carthaginians. Carthage, the old Phoenician colony, was a naval and commercial power. And some conflict of interest between Rome and Carthage was inevitable once Rome became dominant in Italy. Now, wars, of course, are full of great stories and famous characters. In the First War, Rome had initially no navy. Sources tell us of Romans building ships while would-be sailors practiced in mock-ups. In the Second War, the brilliant general Hannibal crossed the Alps from secure bases in Spain, Rome now had an army, with elephants. Faced the large army and a superb general, Rome first adopted delaying tactics, that is, fought a guerrilla war. Excuse me. Astonishingly, Rome rallied from a terrible defeat at Cannae in 216. In 204 BCE, Rome took the war to Carthage, 
when Scipio invaded North Africa, and the third war was largely caused by Cato the Elder, who ended every speech in the Senate with Carthago delende est, Carthage must be destroyed. He would bring in fresh figs to show just how close Rome's foe was. One is reminded of certain American senators and their nightmares over Cuba. Now, why did Rome win? Tenacity and determination played a role. Flexibility in military tactics was important. Critical was Rome's Italian allies did not fall away. Roman diplomacy proved its value. Now, during the Second Punic War, the Antigonids, the, the, the Hellenistic Greeks, had provided some slight assistance to Hannibal. Some remembered this affront. Rome fought three wars in the Balkans, the first against Macedon, and the other two because various Greek cities and leagues had supported the Antigonids. In the Second Macedonian War, the Seleucids rendered some aid to King Philip V, and between 187 or 188 and 87, Rome reckoned accounts with Antiochus III and swept his forces from the eastern Mediterranean. The Seleucid heartlands and the Ptolemaic Egypt were still independent, but Rome was already meddling in their internal affairs. Now, after the First Punic War, Rome annexed Sicily, Sardinia, and Corsica, which means it, it, it conquered and took over. It just went in and invaded and took over. These were the first provinces. And by 146, Rome had annexed Greece and Carthage. In 133 BCE, King Attalus III of Pergamum, having no heirs, bequeathed his kingdom to Rome. And this act symbolized Roman domination of the Mediterranean world. Now the consequences of empire were great for Rome. Now the institutions of a city-state had to be adapted to govern foreign territories. War provided opportunities for wealth and prestige outside the traditional Roman social and political order. Being constantly at war gradually had a corrosive effect on Rome's society. Veteran soldiers became a disruptive force in politics. Now, in this final part of this lecture, we're going to talk about the culture of the Roman Republic. Now, like its politics and diplomacy, Roman Republican culture was staid, stable, and serious. To understand it, one must start in the Roman household. An aristocratic Roman household comprised a familia, the totality of persons living together in one or more associated dwellings. The head of the household was the pater familias, the oldest male member of the familia, who had life and death power over all of its members. This society was relentlessly male and hierarchical. Romans had a positive cult of their ancestors. Statues or burial masks of dead ancestors were kept in every house. Family history was taught to children, especially to boys. Shakespeare, to the contrary, Cato the Elder was the noblest Roman of them all. At any rate, he was the most exemplary. Cicero wrote a book on the old age of Cato the Elder to stress in his own troubled times how magnificent the Romans of old had been. Cato, who ruled between 234 and 149 BCE, lived through momentous times. He fought in the Second Punic War and the First Macedonian War, and he held the Kestership, Consulship, and Censorship, so the, all the highest offices in Rome. Cato affected a rustic demeanor to avoid all pretense of sophistication. He stood for the sturdy, manly Roman values of olden times, and he helped to pass sumptuary laws regulating women's public appearance with respect to cosmetics and jewelry. And he also helped to pass a law aimed at keeping philosophers, that is, Greeks, out of Rome. And he disliked all alien influences. Now, Cato wrote a book, Origines, for his son. It was the first history of Rome written in Latin, and was designed less to tell all the facts than to parade examples of Roman virtue. He also wrote De Agricultura, a manual for farming. Cato's ideal 
was the citizen farmer soldiers. But as his attempt to ban Greeks shows, the current was already against Cato. From their conquest of the south to their introduction to the Hellenistic world, Romans learned the culture of the Greeks. Rome's earliest writings of which little survives were in Greek. Highborn Romans began regularly to hire Greek tutors to instruct the familia. In 155 BCE, um, Carneades, the head of the Plato's Academy, lectured in Rome and launched Greek philosophy on its course among the Roman elite. This is what Cato objected to. Now, when Latin literacy forms began to emerge, they were deeply influenced by Greeks. The comedian Plautus uh, brought the Greek new comedy of Menander to Rome. Plautus used stock figures, misers, spendthrifts, braggarts, parasites, courtesans, and conniving slaves. And he's riotously funny, but not very original or literally, literally, excuse me, literarily published. Terence was likewise influenced by Greek comedy, but his plays present elegant Latin, well-developed characters, and restrained comedy. And it's worth noting that the Romans refused to build a theater, unlike the Greeks. Now, with the last decades of the Roman Republic, Greek influences and a growing Latin literary maturity and confidence had begun to produce poetry of a very high order. Catalus, who ruled from 80 or who lived from 84 to 54 from Verona in northern Italy, emulated Greek poets, mastered poetic meters, and treated themes of love with sympathy and emotion. Now, two poems by Catalus may stand for the others. So this is uh, his Catalus's poem number eight: "Break off, fallen Catalus, time to cut losses." Bright days shone once, you followed a girl, here and there loved as no other, perhaps shall be loved, then was the time of love's insouciance. Your lust as her will matching, bright days shone on both of you. Now a woman is unwilling, follow suit, weak as you are, no chasing of mirages, no fall in love, a clean break, heart against the past. Not again, Lesbia, no more, Catalyst is clear, he won't miss you. You won't crave it. It is cold, but you will whine. You are ruined. What will your life be? Who will visit your room? Who uncover that beauty? Whom will you love? Whose girl will you be? Whom kiss, whom lips bite? Enough, break, catalyst against the past. And his number 70. Lesbia says she'd rather marry me than anyone. Though Jupiter himself came asking, or so she says, but what a woman tells her lover and desires should be written out on air and running water. Now, in many ways, the greatest, most prolific, profound, and synthetic of the Republican writers was Marcus Tullius Cicero, who lived from 106 to 43 BCE. Now, Cicero was an influential public figure in his own day and widely read and admired ever since. His most well-known writings are his forensic speeches. Now, these events a mastery of the rhetorical arts second to none. Cicero upheld standards of absolute integrity in the conduct of public life. Remember that Cato was his ideal. His political writings, especially on the Republic, on the laws, and on duties, took the harvest of classical Greek political thought and added to it stoic concepts of natural law and traditional Roman ethics. He attempted to make a case that advantage can never conflict with right for everything that is morally right is advantageous, and there could be no advantage in anything that is not morally right. He also spoke eloquently, but in the end, ineffectively against tyranny. Now we may sum up this account of Roman Republican culture by thinking about Rome's greatest hero, Aeneas the central figure in Rome's epic, the Aeneid. Now, we'll come back to Virgil and his Aenea later in the course, but Virgil lived through the late Republic, and in writing his great poem, he looked back ruefully at what might have been. He created in his Aeneas, Pius Aeneas, perhaps the dullest figure in epic literature. 
but he endowed Aeneas with qualities that the best of the Romans always wished to believe were their natural inheritance. Pietas, uh, which means this, uh, this, is, this doesn't mean piety in our sense. It means loyalty, reliability, and honor. Gravitas, and this literally means weightiness, that is, seriousness. Constantia, which means perseverance, commitment, and dedication. And magnitudo animi, which literally means the greatest of spirit. But by extension, it implies a devotion to higher causes, not to praise, power, or material well-being. So again, the ideal Roman would have pietas, gravitas, constantia, and magnitudo animi. Now, it may be that few Romans lived up to these ideals, but the ideals themselves reveal much of us, or much to us, excuse me, about what the Romans at their best wish to be, and perhaps what we wish to be in Western civilization today. So this is the end of today's lecture on, on Rome. Uh, in the next lecture, we'll be talking about the motion from the Roman Republic uh, to the Empire and the development of what we think of Rome today. We'll also be looking at um, Rome's golden and silver ages. We'll be looking at the development of uh, the, or the Pax Romana in between those two things. And then uh, we'll also talk about uh, the development. Let me look at my list here. Uh, 20, 21, 22. We'll also be talking about uh, Jesus and the development of Christianity during this time period. And finally end with the emergence of uh, the Christian church before we move into late antiquity. So this is the end, like I said, of today's lecture, History 104. And I look forward to discussing more with you in the future. Have a great day, everyone.